I have six o'clock over here. Here we go. Let's everyone get a start. Good evening. At 6 p.m., I will now call this regular meeting of the Fayette County Board of Education to order. Ms. Daly, would you please take roll? Good evening. Good evening. Ms. Amy Green. Present. Mr. Tom Jones. Present. Ms. Christy Morris. Present. Mr. Tyler Murphy. Present. Ms. Stephanie Spires. Present. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Daly. I'd like to welcome everyone joining us for tonight's meeting, and I also remind our folks, I see some folks standing in the back, we do have an overflow room. Uh, if you exit those doors, it's just around the corner on your left, and our staff will be happy to direct you there if that would be easier for you as well. Um, this is certainly a momentous day for us for several reasons. Uh, the first is because this is Dr. Ligon's first official day as superintendent of schools in Fayette County. Our board team is excited and delighted to have Dr. Liggins with us up here on this dais, and we certainly look forward to working with him in partnership uh, for the children and families of Fayette County Public Schools. So thank you very much, Dr. Liggins. We look forward to that. And this is also a momentous occasion because this is our first regular meeting of the Fayette County Board of Education that we are holding in person since February 24th, 2020. And so we... And we will begin our meeting with a moment of silence, Pledge of Allegiance, and reading of the mission statement led by Board Vice Chair Ms. Amy Green. Please stand for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. The mission of Fayette County Public Schools is to create a collaborative community that ensures all students achieve at high levels and graduate prepared to excel in a global society. Thank you, Vice Chair Green. As I stated earlier, today is Dr. Ligon's first day as superintendent. One of the responsibilities that comes with his new role is now serving as uh, secretary of the Board of Education. At this time, a motion is in order to appoint Superintendent Demetrius Liggins as our board secretary. Do I have a motion to that effect? I'll make a motion to appoint Demetrius Liggins as board secretary. We have a motion by board member Spires. Is there a second? Second. We have a second by board member Green. Uh, the question is on appointing Superintendent Demetrius Liggins as board secretary. Is there any discussion on the question? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Next, I will accept a motion to adopt the agenda for tonight's meeting with any uh, changes voiced, including the lifting of items from the consent agenda for discussion. Is there a motion to accept the agenda as presented? I'll make a motion to present the agenda, or to approve the agenda as presented. A motion by Board Member Morris. Is there a second? Second. Second by Board Member Green. Questions on approval of the agenda as presented. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Motion carries 5-0. During the summer, we do not have a teacher, student, and classified employee representative, but we will pick up that practice when school resumes. And at this time, I'm happy to turn the agenda over to Dr. Liggins for his first superintendent's report. Thank you, Chairman Murphy. Before beginning the report, I'd like to do my own welcome to everyone joining us for tonight's meeting. As I put out in my message this morning, I'm a strong advocate for community input, and I appreciate seeing so many faces in the, um, the crowd tonight. So thank you all for, for coming. I look forward to hearing from our stakeholders. Um, before um, I get into the meat of the superintendent's report, I would like to share some news about the district. Yesterday, believe it or not, Lexington native and 2012 Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School graduate Lee Kiefer 
um, made history when she became the first American male or female to win a gold medal in the individual foil for fencing and earned Team, US, Team USA's first fencing medal in the Tokyo Olympics. Lee um, grew up here in Lexington and after graduating from Dunbar in 2012, went on to graduate from Notre Dame in 2017 and is currently a medical student at the University of Kentucky um, College of Medicine. Um, also this morning, um, our students began their third session of Summer Ignite um, at 62 of our schools and special programs throughout the district. Um, we anticipate roughly around 3,000 students to be served this week. Uh, the session, which lasts just one week, is including our incoming kindergartners, our incoming sixth graders, and freshmen. Um, ninth graders um, to help with a smoother transition as they transition to their new schools. Um, since this is my first week also, I look forward to actually visiting those students and uh, we have something in common, so we'll um, be visiting them on Wednesday. Um, the first official item of our superintendent's report is an update um, on the work of the FCPS COVID-19 core team. Um, I've had the opportunity to participate in a portion of the meeting last week, and it was evident that the team is committed to making recommendations based on expert guidance and science and safeguard and health of our employees, students, and families. I was also impressed with how closely um, our school district actually partners with the Lexington Fayette County Health Department. and. To start off our presentation this evening, I would like to introduce Lexington Fayette County Commissioner of Health, Dr. Craig Hombaugh. Hey, thank you, Dr. Liggins. Can you hear me okay? I cannot see you all, but hopefully you can hear me. Can you hear me now? Okay, you're ready to go. All right, can you hear me okay? What about now? No, rat. Go ahead, Doctor. All right. How about now? Can you hear me okay? Okay, great, excellent, thank you. Uh, thank you again, uh, Superintendent Liggins. Uh, welcome to Lexington. Uh, we're excited to be working with you. We appreciate your uh, Fayette County Public School team and the community for holding together as the pandemic continues to unfold. Um, like other areas of the state and the country, COVID cases in Lexington uh, have increased substantially over the last few weeks. Just a month ago, uh, the Lexington Fayette County Health Department was reporting less than 10 cases uh, per day. And today, our rolling seven day average case count is 56 cases per day and rising each day. Um, the numbers of cases are now really comparable to where they were in late February and early March here in Lexington. Um, and for those who prefer to use the color-coded zone mapping uh, system, that puts Fayette County squarely in the orange zone, which is between 10 and 25 cases per 100,000 per day. Um, so why are we seeing this upward trend? What's the reason for that? Well. The Delta variant, unfortunately, is now the predominant circulating variant in the U.S. 
it's uh, much more contagious than the traditional variant or even the alpha variant, um, and therefore it's more dangerous for unvaccinated people. Um, and even some fully vaccinated folks are, um, are contracting COVID. Although in general, there are always exceptions, but in general, most of those fully vaccinated people either have mild illness or um, they're not symptomatic if they're immunocompetent. Uh, the other reasons why we're seeing increased cases are that many restrictions were relaxed six weeks ago, and that's led to increased opportunities for social mixing and therefore for community spread of the virus. And then it's vacation season. So we have folks from Lexington who are traveling to other areas of the country where COVID incidence is higher than here in central Kentucky. Um, in addition to the increased numbers of cases, we're also seeing that the percentage of COVID cases in Lexington that are in school aged children is gradually going up. And that's been happening over the last seven, several months. And now that age group accounts for approximately 20%, just over 20% of the county's cases um, this month, for instance. That's probably not surprising because many children are too young uh, to be able to receive the vaccine. So we've got this population that's unvaccinated and therefore susceptible um, to COVID and they're making up a greater proportion of the cases that we're seeing in Lexington. Um, while in Lexington, over three quarters of adults have had at least one uh, vaccination of COVID vaccine and over two thirds of adults have been fully vaccinated, which is great news. Um, only about a quarter of our 12 to 17 year olds have been fully vaccinated. And remember, these are the folks that are eligible, the children that are eligible to receive the vaccination, about a quarter have been vac fully vaccinated so far at this time. Uh, the one change it's, that I want to point out um, that's a happy change, at least for now, from the February and March, is that when we had this number of cases in February and March, hospitalizations were much higher. Hospitalizations this time have, and deaths, have increased. We've had increased reporting but they've not kept the par with what we saw in February and March. Um, so that indicates that the vaccine is working as it's supposed to, to prevent serious illness in those who are fully vaccinated. Um, so that's good news and we'll keep an eye on that, but we hope that trend continues. So again, we're seeing more hospitalizations, but not nearly the number that we saw when we had this number of cases. Uh, in the late winter, early spring. Um, and almost all, that's not true, almost all, but most of the um, folks who are uh, in the hospital with COVID are unvaccinated. And you can look at that data on your website if you're interested, and our website if you're interested in seeing more details. Um, so what does that mean as we look ahead to the fall session for schools? Well, firstly, again, the trend is for increasing rising cases, uh, prevalence or incidence in the community is increasing. And um, we also have at the same time a vaccine that though not perfect is effective, and, but only a quarter of our 12 and older population have been fully vaccinated as we get ready to go back to the, for the fall session. So given that, let's review the guidance for K through 12 schools. And I'm gonna review guidance from three, uh, guidances from three authorities, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the State Health Department, Kentucky Department for Public Health, and then the AAP, which is the American Academy of Pediatrics. And much of these three guidance overlaps the information overlaps, but there are some differences in those guidances too. So first of all, I want to point out that all three sets of guidance stress that students benefit from 
in-person learning and that in-person instruction can be done in a way that reduces risks for students and staff. Um, and all endorse the concept of what they call layers of protection to reduce the risk. And these are layered strategies that can either be added or subtracted depending on um, COVID community incidents and vaccination rates. And some of these layers include obviously isolation and quarantine, which we've been doing throughout the pandemic, social or physical distancing, mask wearing, hand washing, environmental cleaning, and even some, considering some strategies such as surveillance testing. So some combination of those, and the more of those may be effective um, as cases go up. One consistent requirement, requirement, not recommendation, in all the strategies is for mask wearing on buses. Um, and that includes school buses, regardless of vaccination status. From a public health standpoint, case investigation, contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine will continue um, in the school setting as it is in other community settings in order to control the spread of COVID. Where the guidance diverges in these three sets of guidance is the strategy of face coverings. Um, CDC recommends that all persons two years and up who are unvaccinated wear face coverings to um, and to consider what they call universal masking, which is everybody, staff and students, uh, masking in schools where large populations are unvaccinated. And then AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, recommends that all students and staff in every school, at all schools, um, practice universal masking because many students are not old enough to be vaccinated because there are low vaccination coverage rates for those that are eligible to be vaccinated and because of the difficulty enforcing masking policies based on vaccination status. So that's, that's the diverging divergence or the differences between these guidances. As a pediatrician and public health official, you know, I recommend universal mask wearing in schools where students are not yet eligible for vaccination. So we have large populations um, that are under 12 that are not able to get vaccine. Um, I recommend that, especially as we are seeing and experiencing an increase in cases in the community. Um, students and staff have demonstrated in the spring and over the summer um, Ignite sessions that uh, they can consistently wear a mask appropriately during the school day. Our school nurses will still be available to assist staff and conduct rapid diagnostics um, so these are diagnostic testing for students and staff who show symptoms while at school, and that helps us with um, identifying cases early in the school setting. And of course, physical distancing is continuing to be recommended wherever possible, um, and outdoor activities preferred to indoor activities as the weather permits. Good hand washing, obviously, environmental cleaning uh, are still important strategies. You know, as the cases go up or down, as vaccination rates change, as we see what occurs, if there are new variants on the scene that pose threats, then the numbers and types of strategies recommended will likely evolve to match what's happening in the community in order to control spread and reduce risk. Um, I've said it before, I'm going to end my presentation with there's never a no risk scenario with in person instruction, but with protections in place, we can reduce the risks and benefits should outweigh the risks. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Liggins. Um, is this a time for question and answer or do we wait for uh, additional information? Any questions, board members, for Dr. Humball? Dr. Humball, we appreciate your time, uh, as always, and coming and sharing with us, as well as your work with our staff and the COVID core team. We, we thank you.
uh, thank you, board, and thank you, Dr. Humbaugh. Uh, the COVID core team will me be meeting again tomorrow with our partners from the Lexington Fayette Health Department in order to revise the guidance document that uh, will be shared with our employees, families, and communities fairly soon. Um, as you know and have heard over and over, vaccination is the best protection against COVID-19 at this time, and Fayette County Public Schools has partnered with the City of Lexington Health First Bluegrass Lexington Fayette County Health Department and Wild Health to offer COVID-19 vaccines to um, at 18 convenient school locations uh, this week. So on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the 27th, the 28th, and the 29th, this is available. Um, Everyone 12 years of age or older is eligible to be vaccinated at no cost, and fully vaccinated individuals may not have to quarantine if they're exposed to the COVID-19 virus in the future. Um, appointments are available from 1 to 6 p.m., and we encourage everyone to sign up to receive their vaccinations at fcps.net forward slash vaccines. If a student between the ages of 12 and 17 uh, if they are in, in that age group, a parent or guardian will need to complete an online consent form or be present at the vaccination clinic to provide consent. Sites are open to everyone regardless of school enrollment, um, attendance, or residence. So, um, and also, uh, many of you are aware that the K Kentucky Department of Education Commissioner Jason Glass and Kentucky Board of Education Board Chair Lou Young joined Governor Andy Beshear's um, COVID-19 um, briefing today at 4 p.m. State leaders like Fayette County Public School leaders are prioritizing in-person learning and mitigating the risk of disruption. Um, they made the following recommendations. School districts should require all unvaccinated students and unvaccinated adults to wear masks when in the classroom and other indoor settings. School districts should require all students under 12 years of age to wear masks when in classrooms and other indoor school settings. School districts wishing to optimize safety and minimize risks of the educational and athletic disruption should require all students and all adults to wear masks while in the classroom and other indoor settings. The governor also discussed a voluntary testing program being offered by the Kentucky Department for Public Health in partnership with the Center for Disease Control. The information shared this afternoon will be part of our conversation and deliberations as we work to finalize the health and safety protocols for the upcoming school year. Um, <clears throat> the next item under the superintendent's report is a brief presentation from grant manager, Dr. Soraya Matthews about the American Rescue Plan ESSER funding. Dr. Matthews. Right there. Now I'm ready. Good evening and thank you. As Dr. Liggins shared, I am here to share a little bit about our ARP ESSER funds. Um, and if you will remember just some historical context, uh, our district has gone through now three iterations of ESSER funding. Uh, the first um, funds, which was called F CARES funding, came through last year or late last year. Uh, the second fund, which is ESSER II, was December of last year, approximately $928 million for the entire state that was divided through all of our LEAs in Kentucky. And now the third round of funding, known as ARP ESSER, is a total of $2 billion that has been um, divided among all of our LEAs throughout our district, throughout the state of Kentucky. Dr. Matthews, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you mind just to pull the microphone down just a smidge? Sure. There you go. Excellent. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Sure. Should I repeat that or? Yeah, you're, you, you should be good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So jumping right in, our ARP funding, uh, the reason that we have our ARP funding is much like our other ESSER funding sources. It is to provide emergency aid for our districts to overcome any barriers that we may have experienced due to COVID. Uh, is also a uh, focus on safe return to schools and mitigation strategies that will be put in place in our school and our district. And then specifically, there are purposes aligning to what um, our state or our federal funding res refers to as learning loss uh, and what our strategies will be to address that with our students. 
Our total ARP ESSER award amount is $97,622,914. A special note there that you may have heard a different amount earlier in the year, and that was due to a calculation error that took place through the Cabinet of Health and Family Services. Um, and so KDE has issued a, uh, a, a different reward, an amended award amount for our district. The requirements for our ARP ESSER funding are uh, in twofold. First and foremost, meaningful consultation with all stakeholders. And I want to point out that with our board members, I think it's important that you all know that we'll be touching base with you very, very soon to uh, gather your feedback and input and engage your thoughts around strategies for our ARP funding. But we'll also have strategies in place to engage our families, our students, our community, um, other stakeholders, businesses, as well as any groups of organizations who represent our most vulnerable populations throughout our community. The second part of our requirement as part of our ARP funding is a plan that outlines specifically what our back to school mitigation strategies will be for a safe return to schools. Um, also including specific academic strategies that are evidence-based strategies that will be used in our classroom along with our students. And then thirdly, uh, what are we doing around mental support, um, that whole child development piece and how we're addressing that with our students and our families as well. So those are our two primary factors or two primary requirements that come with our ARP ESSER funding. Our timeline for ESSER ARP, um, very, very uh, tight timelines here on some of these things. Uh, so I want to make sure that you are aware of what will be coming in our very near future here. Uh, at the end of the month, July 31, we have to have an outline of our plan with high level topics of what we um, envision we will be doing in our plan. So it's not the actual finalized plan. I want to make sure I highlight that. It's more of an outline of how we intend to implement our plan. Also on July 31st, we have to have had our safe return to in-person instruction in continuing continuous, continuous services posted to our district website. Uh, and our uh, CCT team is actually working on that. In the month of August, we have to have our official spending plan uploaded in a program that goes directly to KDE. It's called GMAP. It's the grant um, servicing program that allows us to give narratives around our budget and some more details around the outline of that plan that I mentioned earlier. In addition to that, we have to sign off on our district assurances, and that has to be complete. And I want to make sure that, that you understand that that's different from some assurances that you may be reviewing today later in our agenda. Uh, there will be specific assurances for ARP. Uh, and then in September, after we have gauged our stakeholders, including our board members, our students, our families, our community, we will start developing our plan um, in early September and with hopes of trying to start in, and really start to engage in that plan in our community by early October. And with that said, I always want to bring to attention that this has been a collaborative effort throughout our community, throughout our district, uh, with multiple partners and multiple departments within our district at the table and having discussions about next steps for this effort. Uh, and that actually completes my presentation. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Any questions, board members? Okay. We appreciate your work, and we look forward to um, our continuing collaboration and conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Matthews and board. At this time, I'd like to ask Chief Operating Officer Myron Tubson to present the monthly construction update progress report. Thank you, Dr. Liggins. Good evening, board. Just to cover a few of our projects, a couple here, our secure festival at the Johnson Building, I'm pleased to announce it is 99.9% .9 complete, and uh, we will start the school year with all the schools in Fayette County having a secure festival, so I think that's something that should be acknowledged and applauded. So again, thanks to the board and the community for making that happen. So. Um, 
you will see here that uh, I think I noted that we just need a light fixture that has been back ordered, as you can imagine, a lot of just logistical issues, but we just need to get that light installed and just a few little punch list items. But essentially the work that we wanted to get done has been accomplished. Uh, now it's just a matter of getting the furniture in place. Uh, it delivers tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. We will be doing the install and getting everything ready for our scholars to arrive in the fall. So the playground is installed. We just need to get the mulch down, uh, some resurfacing at the parking lot, some striping, uh, just sprucing the place up a little more. But essentially the floors have been waxed. They're just waiting to get the furniture in. So we're just excited about getting these scholars started off on the right foot. So. That concludes the update for that project. Uh, for Tate Street High School, uh, you will see that we're a little over 50% uh, complete there. And uh, this time next year, it will be a flurry of activity uh, getting that school brought online because, as you know, we've been operating uh, within the school itself. And once the new building comes online uh, next summer, will be demolition and sort of getting the grounds ready there uh, for the scholars. Uh, we have a 3D rendering of our facility at Tate's Creek. Uh, last month, we pretty much were framing in areas A and B. Uh, we had some walls going up in areas C and D as well. Uh, we had piping and duct installation throughout, as well as uh, acoustical metal uh, roof deck in area E of the main gym and auxiliary gym. Roof joist, and we installed fixtures at the field house. We this month continued our geothermal and our window installations. We've had brick installation in various areas throughout the project. We've had uh, metal roofing installation at area B, uh, again, more acoustical metal roof decking in area F along with the gym, and just more duct work and um, a top swell and under drainage at the baseball and softball fields. There is some visuals of the work that is taking place. Uh, it is just, again, a flurry of activity, and it is a very impressive project. So we are excited about getting this building turned over to the stakeholders there at Tates Creek High School. So. As always, there is information available on the website uh, in terms of our progress, and that concludes my report. Chair Murphy, I do have one quick question. Board Member Spires. Um, do you have the information, or can you share the information with the board members about the ribbon cutting on August 7th for Carter G? Uh, we actually had a discussion with the principal and the chief today. Uh, a little bit of that is in limbo pending what we decide um, tomorrow. Um, in terms of CCT. So uh, the principal in chief and I have been collaborating and we are working with you. So we will be in a position uh, to give you more information after tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Board Member Spires, any other questions? Board members? Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. That concludes the superintendent's report. At this time, I'll turn the agenda back over to Chairman Murphy. Thank you, Dr. Liggins. Next on our agenda is a time for remarks by citizens. Fayette County Board of Education Policy 01.45 states members of the public may address the board during the period set aside by the board without submitting an item for the agenda. No action shall be taken during this portion of the meeting on issues raised by employees or the public unless it's deemed an emergency by the board. Please note the speakers will not be allowed to make any disparaging or critical remarks about individuals or employees of the district, critical comments or complaints or process of the district's complaint procedures, which afford the individuals to whom comments or complaints are directed the opportunity for response and due process. There are two opportunities for the public to address our board. At the beginning of the meeting, the public who have signed up prior to the meeting is invited to speak on items that are on the agenda. This is not intended to be a time for debate. However, uh, the board will take the public's input into consideration when making final decisions uh, this evening. Each speaker uh, will be allowed this evening, based upon the number that we've had signed up and the topics that they've indicated, one minute of speaking time. And at the end of the meeting, members of the public, I'll ask that there not be disruptions to the meeting. Members of the public, each at the end of the meeting, members of the public who have signed up prior to the meeting are invited to address the board on any topic of district-related concern that is not on the official agenda for this meeting. Please know that since these items are not on tonight's agenda, our board may or may not comment. It is important to know that this is not intended to be a time where issues will be debated. At this time, uh, we have 17 members of the public who have signed up to speak to matters on the agenda. I will ask each of them to keep their remarks to uh, one minute, and I will ask General Counsel Shelley Chatfield to serve as our timekeeper. And at this time, our first speaker will be Mr. Chuck Eddy, and if you will come up to the podium um, and speak. 
And we'll just need to make sure, Ms. Chatfield, that the microphone is on. For the, yeah. okay. Greetings. Uh, I'm Chuck Eddy. I'm speaking for myself as a member of the community. 611,000 Americans have died unnecessarily to co due to COVID-19. I recently saw a study by Dr. Campbell of England. It was published on the virological.org. It said that the Delta variant is 1,200 times more, has 1,200 times more viral load than the earlier ones. Masks have been shown to reduce the spread of disease by reducing the spread of droplets and aerosol transmission. It's not a personal choice or a matter of liberty. It's a matter of public health. It has been since day one. The high numbers of COVID cases and deaths have been due to people fighting masking, social distancing, and vaccinations. To show how serious this is, the VA has just said that every healthcare worker in the Veterans Administration must be vaccinated. You have 15 have seconds. To do that. I have what? You have 15 seconds. Sorry. We need to maximize masking in schools to reduce the spread of COVID, uh, especially protect kids and those who can't get vaccinated for legitimate medical reasons. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Eddie. You. And we will ask that we please be respectful of each individual that is sharing their public comment with the board. Our next speaker will be Carrie Cox. Yes, I think we've gotten our answer about what the end game is here. Um, they're going to back, they're going to um, require masking of our children until they get the mRNA experimental vaccine, which I have no problem with adults. But um, any place that there has been a school system or a country where the children have been masked versus not, there's no discernible difference. And I sent you all a letter in Sweden. There was a, uh, there, as of uh, the um, New England Journal of Medicine, there was not one school child that had had a COVID fatality. Sweden school was never closed. They never had masks. They never had plexiglass, of glass. And they never had alternative schedule. And not one child died. And their, and their faculty was at no more risk or lower than the, than the general public. Is Stockholm so much different than Lexington, Kentucky? Why are we doing this? What's the agenda? And I'd like to add something into the record. Um, the schools in Gainesville, University of Florida, looked at masks after a day of use. And um, it's pretty bad. A lot of bacteria on these masks. They're very unhealthy. Thank you, Ms. Can Cox. Can I enter this into evidence? Thank you, Ms. Cox. Thank you. Can time. I enter this into evidence? You, you are Thank welcome you. to send any public, any additional comments to the board as well. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker this evening is Jessica Heiler. Good evening, board and Dr. Liggins. Um, on behalf of the Fayette County Education Association Board of Directors, I would just like to share some brief thoughts um, regarding the 21-22 school year. First of all, we want to thank the members of the COVID core team who have worked so hard this last year and the board for their efforts to protect our students and our staff. And we encourage the COVID core team and the board to continue to reach out to our educators as they make plans for the start of the school year. We need to ensure that the staff that work with students every day have the resources they need to provide a safe learning environment for our students in the face of the pandemic. I'm an educator and a mom of students in Fayette County, and I understand how difficult this was, this last year was for our community. It took flexibility, creativity, and kindness from our educators, parents, and caregivers in the seconds. face that was presented by COVID. In light of today's recommendations from the governor, Dr. Glass, and health officials, it is vitally important that we follow the science and guidance from our health officials, ensuring, ensuring students can have a successful school year. We urge the district and the community to stay vigilant as, continue, as conditions continue to evolve. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matthew Vide. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Veed. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Veed. Here's my hope that Fayette County Schools takes seriously the very first of its core values, which is students first. Specifically, my hope is that every decision that made is first run through the filter of what is best for kids. There are other considerations, sure, but the first priority should always be what is the best for the kids in the classroom. This feels a little like stating the obvious, but after the last 18 months, it's an important reminder. 
Our students and our teachers suffered through months and months of virtual learning, of virtual learning seemingly because of the threat of an outbreak of schools were opened. My first graders should not have borne the heaviest burden of the risk of COVID. This is especially true because young kids are the least impacted by COVID. This is a scientifically indisputable fact. We were tremendously lucky that COVID left kids largely unscathed, but we acted as if the opposite were true. Seconds. So here's the ask, here's the request. I'm asking you to remove all barriers to education for this school year. No masks, no partitions, no limits on physical interaction, no limits on the use of physical learning tools. The vaccine is readily available. It's easy Your to get. It's effortless to get. And my child should not have educational barriers Thank because you, an Mr. adult B. chooses to not get vaccinated. Thank you, Mr. B. Our next guest this evening, our next speaker this evening is Winchell Vincent. Winchell Vincent is our next speaker. Thank you for the time. The one thing Fayette County Public Schools does well is athletics, and I appreciate the, my son's opportunity to play. I received a email this morning from our coach saying effectively that there would be vaccine passports for athletes. This is coercive. It is disingenuous. It's dangerous in my opinion, and it's completely unnecessary. It's everything we don't want our Fayette County Public Schools or our education system to be. One of the reasons I say it's disingenuous, when you listen to the doctor at the beginning of this meeting, there's never a comparative analysis. Are you gonna stop eating barbecue? Are you gonna stop eating ice cream? Are you gonna stop driving out on the road? All these things present risks, health risks, and yet never is there a competitive seconds. analysis. Last year, we had a mostly normal but short athletic season. Not one athlete passed away. Not one athlete was seriously injured or from COVID. You must put these things into perspective. Your time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Vincent. Our next speaker is Andrea Welker. Good evening. My husband wanted to be here this evening, but he's at the hospital working with uh, COVID patients where we are seeing uh, an unfortunate surge in our community again in hospitalizations. During the past uh, 18 months of this pandemic, uh, plus some, um, the masks have worked because my husband had multiple exposures in the workplace before vaccination. And fortunately, he did not contract it. And that's anecdotal evidence. What we want to base our decisions on and what you all have continued to base your decisions on, and thank you, is evidence. And that's what we need to keep in mind, that feelings and, and the opinions of amateurs, even like myself, do not matter in the face of evidence seconds. by professionals. My kids will continue to wear masks regardless of what the decision is. And we do that to keep our community safe. My daughter who's under 12, who cannot be vaccinated to keep her safe. And that's that's should Your be the priority. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Welker. Our next speaker is Courtney Ture. Good evening. I'm a K through five music teacher in another county and the parent of two Fayette County children. And I'm here to express my view that parents should be allowed to make their own choices about masks, regardless of vaccination status. I urge you to use common sense as many districts around the country here in our state and city have already begun to do and not require masks for children vaccinated or not. I'm often told that the COVID core team will be making recommendations to our board about school decisions. This is an unelected board. We don't know all the names of the people on this board and we don't have any way to speak to them. Are there doctors with differing viewpoints on this board, for instance, the European equivalent of the CDC does not re recommend masks for children under the age of 12. 
has the COVID core team taken this into consideration? And while I know that the CDC is often referred to when making these decisions, I'd like to remind everyone that the CDC was shown to be heavily influenced by powerful Your time unions has expired. when making recommendations. It's a little bit backwards Thank to you, expect children to be the ones protecting adults. Thank you, Ms. Trey. Our next speaker. Our next speaker is Mary. Mary Grayler. I strongly disagree with Dr. Humble, and I'm surprised that there were no questions from the board uh, regarding what he said. I'm tired of seeing students getting on and off the school buses this summer, often in 90 degrees heat, wearing masks. That's dangerous. The unconstitutional mask mandate in Kentucky is lifted, so why is it still required for our children? This is Kentucky, and Dr. Liggins, welcome to Kentucky, and I pray you bring a little bit of the Texas attitude to Kentucky. I'm disappointed and ashamed that Fayette County School District still requires our students to mask up, and we are better than that. Studies show that children up to 18 years old have a uh, recovery rate of 99.99%, that's four nines, from co to recover from COVID. Masks are unconstitutional and our God-given constitutional rights don't end during a pandemic. Masks severely restrict oxygen levels after only three minutes. They dehumanize individuals, they depersonalize individuals. In satanic rituals, they wear masks, they stand six feet apart, and we are not in a satanic Your time uh, ritual. has expired. Thank and you, Ms. Grayler. We would ask you to uh, stand up. We demand better for our children and our Thank grandchildren. You, Educate yourself and the truth will set you free. Our next speaker is Maureen Carmen. Maureen Carmen is our next speaker. Good evening. Welcome, Dr. Liggins, to the questions and answers. I only have a couple of things to say. Um, one is that I have not heard anything about the uh, risk and benefit with regard to social uh, effects on our children, particularly our young children in primary, uh, developmental, psychological, physiological compromises that we're putting our children at risk. This kind of risk-benefit analysis has to be done as well as what we heard the health director say. A uh, couple of other things I'll just follow up on. I picked up a kindergartner at his uh, orientation today. His mask was soaked. 15 and seconds. And I said, take it off right now. Do not mask. Make it, make it uh, optional, but don't require these kids to wear masks. Second, athletes. We are going to kill our athletic program, and I agree with the gentleman who Your spoke. Your time has expired. Thank you. No masks. Thank you, Ms. Carmen. Our next speaker is Andrew Cooperrider. I have a nine-year-old son that goes to school at Fayette County Public Schools, and he wore a mask when school returned. You told us at that time it was to protect him spreading it to other people, their parents getting it, passing on to grandparents. Though I disagree with the efficacy of masks, at least that logic, if masks work, makes sense. However, now we've gotten to a point where if anybody wants to get vaccinated, they can. So you're not doing it to protect it from spreading to others. You would be doing it only to protect kids. According to the state numbers, only two people, children under the age of 18, have died from COVID in this state. Only one of them of school age. According to the CDC, it's zero because they only count confirmed COVID deaths, not probable. More children die on their way to school than have died from COVID in this entire state. Why are we continuing down this road and who are we protecting? I want to be able to send my kid to Fayette County Public Schools this next year. Are you going to be able to make that happen? Your time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Cooper Ryder. Our next speaker is Micah Sims.
Thank you. I'm a mother to a 12-year-old daughter that is in uh, Fayette County, and we're just asking for choice on this on this matter. Um, you all don't know my daughter. You don't know her medical history, and she does not want to wear a mask, and she can't wear a mask. She cannot get vaccinated. And the bullying that's going on with this to get them vaccinated is something that we as a school district have spoken out about so many times. And y'all talk about the CDC. We didn't elect the CDC. We elected you all and we're here and we're asking for choice. If you want to get vaccinated, we know where to go and get vaccinated. 15 seconds. And less than 50% of adults in this state have chosen to get vaccinated. And we just want the choice. We just want the choice. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you want to get vaccinated, go get vaccinated. We just want the choice for our kids. We want to make the choice as a parent. Thank you, Mr. Sims. Our next speaker is Richard Montgomery. According to Johns Hopkins Medical Center, herd immunity was reached in April. They currently estimate that 40 to 50 percent of the American population has already gotten COVID and gotten over it. Vaccine does not relate the best immunity to COVID. Getting COVID and getting over it does. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't get vaccinated if you don't want to, but it is not necessary to keep our children in masks all day long to try and protect people who are obviously going to be required to wear masks while they're there. There are only two children who died younger than 19 in this state since this started, and they had COVID. They did not necessarily die of COVID. Of the 600,000 represented or, or referenced earlier that died from COVID, those are COVID associations. 15 People seconds. who were shot in the face or were blown up or run over by a truck and tested positive for COVID were counted as a COVID death. So here's the deal. We can take care of our children and protect them and protect our teachers without your time has expired. Worse. Thank you, Mr. Montgomery. Karen Goss is our next speaker. Karen Goss. From April to October of 2020, our U.S. emergency room visits linked to mental health problems for children ages 5 to 11 increased by nearly 25 percent and increased by 31 percent for ages 12 to 17 years old as compared to the same period in 2019. During the month of June 2020, 25 percent of persons aged 18 to 24 in the U.S. reported suicidal ideation. While some of this may be related to the pandemic, we suspect that it is largely a function of our response to the pandemic. One of the most starkly revealing and troubling observations come from Dr. Marguerite Rees Brisson, MD, PhD, who is Europe's leading neurologist, neurophysiologist, focused on neurotoxology, environmental seconds. medicine, neural regeneration, and neuroplasty. She's gone on the record that rebreathing our exhaled air will without a doubt create oxygen deficiency and flooding of carbon dioxide. We know that this isn't right. It's not Your right for our kids at all. And it really you, should Goss. stop now. Our next speaker is Destiny Darby. I, I hate to waste time, but I just have to go on record saying that I am baffled at the blatant and obvious one-sided information that was given um, throughout this meeting. Um, I can only hope that you would all be educated and smart enough um, to do the research for yourself. Um, my name is Destiny Darby. I am here representing Moms for Liberty, the Fayette County chapter. I'm here to simply make you aware 
um, of our organization. We are a nonpartisan, parent-led organization. Our mission is simple. We will hold our school board accountable for every decision made affecting our children. Mask, vaccination, segregation, and curriculum, to name a few, which um, I would also like to state has been happening since um, high school sports started back. I have a high school athlete. Um, the segregation has already been happening. Um, I would also um, like to remind you that regardless of our governor's guidelines um, that are based on no research, no data, or no logic, you still have not only the Your obligation, but the right to make Thank the you, right Ms. decision Darby. for our children. Thank you, Ms. Darby. <laughs> our next speaker is Susan Van Treese. I'm a retired nurse practitioner, and I have been through the medical field, and we give a lot of credit to science. I really believe that we need to take a second look at where we get our information from. CDC, a lot of the, the people that have moved from there have moved into the drug companies to push vaccines. As far as making our kids have vaccines or saying that they are better off, we have to look that this is an emergency authorized a medical intervention. It has not been uh, vetted um, through the, um, the... 15 seconds. Thank you. Um, through the voluntary adverse event uh, reaction system, we have found over 7,000 people have died from the vaccine and over 50,000 injuries. 50, Your time 000. has expired. All right. Thank you, Ms. Van Trees. <laughs> Our next speaker is Beth Guyton. I also apologize if I mispronounced that. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm here today as the parent of two Fayette County school children, but um, I'm also a scientist, an educator, and a member of the community. And I have a question for Superintendent Liggins. Hi, it's uh, welcome to Fayette County. It's uh, great to have you here. My question is a follow-up to a question I was lucky enough to have the chance to ask you when you visited, uh, which was regarding masking and vaccinating our students. Uh, at that time, you stated unequivocally that you would not mandate masks or vaccines for any Fayette County studi student, and it would be a matter of choice for parents and students whether to mask or to vaccinate our students. And so my question is a simple one, is that still your position? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Guyton. <laughs> Our, our next speaker, our next speaker is Barry Saturday. Well, with limited time, Dr. Liggins, welcome to the meeting, guys. Uh, wanted to discuss uh, filtration and the psychological impact of uh, masks as well as uh, universal pre-K. So. Uh, concern I've got with masks, it doesn't give up a lot. A few of the speakers here have talked about the nature of filtration itself reduces oxygen flow. Uh, that doesn't get a lot of airtime with the scientific community in terms of how that affects kids and learning. We're also using uh, at SCAPA, I know they were using KN95 masks. Uh, the higher level of filtration prevents viral particles from getting out to a higher degree, but it also greatly limits oxygen flow particularly when oxygen flow is needed the most. 15 say. seconds. Um, wanted to uh, additionally address the smiles. Kids need smiles. It releases serotonin. Uh, behavior will be better. Uh, we saw an instance of suicide, drug overdoses. Uh, we need to do that. I would Your also time has expired. Uh, recommend Thank you, Mr. Saturday. COVID money for uh, universal pre-K infrastructure. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Saturday.
and thank you to the members of the public who participated in public comment. We do have one additional uh, member of the public who has signed up for public comment, but since it is on a matter that is not on our agenda, that will come at the conclusion of the meeting after our action item. So we will uh, return to that at that time. Next on our agenda is the approval of routine matters. This time motion is in order to approve the minutes of the July 12th, 2021 planning work session of the Fayette County Board of Education. Do I have that motion? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the July 12th, 2021 planning work session. Motion by Board Member Spires. Is there a second? Second. Second by Board Member Green. We have a motion and a second. All in favor of approval of the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. And then at this time, I will entertain a motion to approve our consent items as listed. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the consent items as listed. Motion by Board Member Spires. Is there a second? Second. Second by Board Member Morris. Question is on approval of the consent items as listed. Any discussion on the question? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. And at this time, I'll turn the agenda back over to Dr. Liggins to take us through our action items for tonight's meeting. Thank you, board members. We have eight action items for your consideration this evening. First, we have updates to job descriptions for the occupational therapist and physical therapist. If you have any questions, Human Resources Director Jennifer Dyer is available to respond. And I will note that these are all items that were under discussion during our, our planning work session uh, a couple weeks ago. So if there are no further questions from Ms. Dyer, a motion at this time is in order to approve the revised job descriptions for occupational therapist and physical therapist. Do I have that motion? So moved. Motion by Board Member Morris. Is there a second? Second. Second by Board Member Spires. Questions on approval of the job descriptions, the revised job descriptions. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, board. Next, we're seeking your approval for the contract with NWEA for the measures of academic progress test, which we use to monitor how well our students are doing on grade level standards over the course of the school year. If you have any questions about this contract, we have Chief Academic Officer Kate McAnally, and Associate Director of Assessment Literacy, Brooks Stinson. I'm available this evening to provide additional details. Any questions, board member, for Ms. McAnally or Stinson. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the 2021-2022 contract for MAP testing. Is there a motion? I will make a motion to approve the 2021-2022 contract for MAP testing. Motion by Board Member Green. Is there a second? Second. Second by Board Member Morris. Any discussion on the approval of the MAP contract? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, board. Our next contract for consideration is the Illuminate um, Education for Fast Bridge Testing, which we use for progress monitoring to ensure that all interventions we provide are supporting student success. Again, Chief Academic Officer Kate McAnally and Associate Director of Assessment on Literacy Brooks Stinson are available to answer any more further questions you may have at this time. Any questions for staff board members? If there are no further questions, I will entertain a motion to approve the 2021-2022 contract for fast bridge testing. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the contract for fast bridge testing. A motion by board member Morris. Is there a second? Second, second by board member Spires. Questions on approval of the contract for fast bridge testing. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, board. Our final assessment contract tonight is for COGAT Iowa test that we use for our gifted and talented identification. Again, Chief Academic Officer Kate McAnally and Associate Director of Assessment and Literacy, um, Literacy Brooke Stinson are available to respond to questions. Any questions for staff board members? If there are no further questions, a motion is in order to approve the 2021-2022 proposal for district-wide COGAT and Iowa testing. Do I have that motion? I will make a motion to approve the 2021-2022 proposal for the district-wide COGAT Iowa testing. Motion by Board Member Green. Is there a second? Second. 
second by board member Morris. We have a motion and a second on the COGAT Iowa testing contract. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, board. The next matter we are asking for you to approve this evening is a contract with Eastern Kentucky University to offer an English learner's endorsement cohort for FCPS teachers. This project will increase the workforce development in this critical shortage area and support effective instruction for our English learners in the classroom that was discussed um, during your planning session earlier this month. If you have any additional questions, our Director of English Learners and Gifted and Talented, Lori Bowen, is here to provide response. Any questions for Ms. Bowen? Here, if there are no further questions, the motion is in order to approve the contract and memorandum of understanding with Eastern Kentucky University. Do I have that motion? I'll make a motion to um, approve the contract and memorandum of understanding with Eastern Kentucky. Motion by board member Spires. Is there a second? Second. Second by board member Morris. We have a motion and a Second, on approval of the contract and memorandum of understanding with Eastern Kentucky University. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you again, board. The next item for your consideration is a revision of our middle and high school athletic handbooks. At the planning work session meeting, you reviewed the proposed changes with um, in this document. Are there any additional questions this evening? Our Chief of High Schools, James McMillan, is available to respond. Any questions, Board, for Mr. McMillan? If there are no further questions, a motion is in order to approve the changes to the Middle and High School Athletic Guidelines for the 2021-2022 school year as recommended by staff. Do I have that motion? I'll make a motion to approve the changes as recommended by staff. Motion by Board Member Morris. Is there a second? Second. Second by Board Member Spires. Questions on approval of the changes to the Middle and High School Athletic Guidelines. All in, any discussion on the question? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Board. Up next on our agenda is an annual contract with the Central Kentucky Riding for Hope, where stables, where it stables this house. Um, this is a matter that the board renews annually. If you have any questions, Chief of High School, Jason McMillan is available to respond. Any questions, board members? Hearing none, a motion is in order to approve the contract for Central Kentucky Riding for Hope Incorporated. Is there a motion? I will make a motion to approve the contract for Central Kentucky Riding for Hope Incorporated. Motion by board member Green. Is there a second? Second. Second by board member Morris. Question is on approval of the contract for Central Kentucky Riding for Hope. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Board. Our last item for your consideration and action this evening is the annual statement of district's assurances document. This is a routine matter that the Board is required by the Kentucky Department of Education to approve each year and was discussed at length during our uh, during your planning work session earlier this month. If there's any additional questions, Director of Budget and Finance Planning and Sampson Grimes is available to respond. Any questions for Ms. Sampson Grimes? I, I just want to uh, clarify, reiterate, re restate that we can't possibly know whether these conditions and practices, the extent to which they are in place. So we are ha having to operate on the recommendation of the staff and the superintendent. And that is, that recommendation is forthcoming. Is that my understanding? Is that correct? The recommendation is that you approve it okay. this evening. All right, that's so what I wanted to make sure of. Yes. I'm fine with it. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions or discussion for board members? Hearing none, a motion is in order to approve the Fayette County Public Schools submission of statement of assurances for the 2021-2022 school year. Do I have that motion? I'll make that motion to approve the assurances for the 2021-2022 school year. Motion by board member Spires. Is there a second? Second. Second by board member Morris. Questions on approval of the statement of assurances. Any discussion on the question? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0.
Thank you, Board. Under our informational items, the agenda also includes the personnel changes for July, the biannual construction report as of June 30th, 2021, the indirect cost rate approval, and adoption of KD, an adoption by KDE for fiscal year 2022 that financial accounting and business services director Rodney Jackson discussed with you during the budget adoption in May, the school activity funds report, the budget transfer report, and the interfund transfer report. At this time, I will turn the meeting back over to Chair Murphy. We do not have a need to go into closed session this evening. Thank you, Dr. Liggins. Our next item is where members of the public may address the board on any topic of district-related concern that is not on the official agenda for this meeting. Please know that since these items are not on tonight's agenda, our board may or may not comment. It is important to know that this is not intended to be a time where issues will be debated. So the, there is one speaker to sign up on an issue that is not related to an agenda item. That speaker will have one minute as well. And that speaker is Hazel Montgomery. So if Hazel Montgomery can make their way to the podium. And again, our general counsel, Ms. Chatfield, will serve as our timekeeper. Is Hazel Montgomery still in attendance? Okay. We'll let staff check the overflow room just so we're not missing anybody. Okay. Okay, in that case, are there any uh, additional items or any board requests? Okay. No, with the uh, fall of the fiscal year, Mr. is Mr. Jackson here. Mr. Jackson, do you want to address the timeline on the uh, treasurer's report? and how it's impacted by the fiscal year. Good evening. Um, there's never a... Can you hear me now? Okay. There's never a financial report in June, for June and July because of the year in closing. But in, in August, we have two reports. You have the unaudited year report for June and a July report. So you get to see me twice. <laughs> We are looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, a motion is in order to make the agenda dated July 26, 2021, on which action has been taken at this meeting, a part of the minutes as if copied in the minutes verbatim. Is there a motion? I will. A motion by Board Member Spires. A second. Second by Board Member Green. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. And at this time, I will entertain a motion to adjourn this regular meeting of the Fayette County Board of Education. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Motion by Board Member Morris. Is there a second? Second. Second by Board Member Spires. All in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. We are now adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>